Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's germination slash Seed World Retail Roundtable webinar. My name is Mark Sinkowitz, and I'm an editor with Seed World Group, and I am happy to be your host. Today's theme is finding common ground between public and private breeding programs. We'll hear from three experts who will talk about the intricacies surrounding public and private breeding, the interworkings of each, and how our industry can leverage the benefits of the two models to really maximize innovation in, in plant breeding. Now, before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors, 2020 Seed Labs and Secan for their support. We are recording today's webinar, so a record recording will be available on germination.ca and seedworld.com following the event. If you have a question for our speakers, you don't have to wait till the end of the webinar. You can type it in through the YouTube chat box at any time and just let us know who it's directed to and we will take your question during the webinar. Again, you don't have to wait until the end. You're free to ask your question at, at any time. Simply type it into the chat box. Today, we have three speakers. It's going to be a little bit different today. We're going to do it in sort of a panel discussion format as opposed to a traditional webinar slideshow style. I wanted to do that because this is a topic that deserves some genuine discussion and, and not so much focusing on slideshows, but to really have that conversation about public and private breeding. Because this is a topic that, that I find is coming up more and more in the industry, and I'm happy to be able to tackle it today. Public versus private breeding is, is a huge topic, like I say, in plant breeding and seed circles. We're going to delve into some key learning points that dissect this sort of intricate landscape of public and private breeding programs. So together, I hope to unravel the structure, funding mechanisms, and the overarching objectives that define public and private breeding systems. So please join me as we embark on this journey through the uh, realm of agricultural innovation and sustainability today. But our dialogue is not going to stop at just definitions and classifications. Our three speakers today are experts in their domains, and they're going to really help us wade through this. I have with me today Fernando Gonzalez, who is a retired plant breeder and uh, currently a research consultant based in Guadalajara, Mexico. Michael Cantor is a plant breeder based at the University of Hawaii. And last but not least, Lauren Coleman is Regulatory Affairs Manager for Seeds Canada. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for having nice us. Thank you. Nice to see you. So I'm happy that you could all be on today. I, I asked you each to be on because I've had conversations with all three of you in the past in regards to public and private breeding and you really left an impression on me in terms of your knowledge of plant breeding, but also the, the merits of the public and private systems. Now, I want to go around the virtual table here today and ask each of you if you can give our audience an idea of your expertise in this area. I'm going to start with you, Fernando. You've worked in, in both the, the nonprofit and, and for-profit plant breeding sectors. You started at the International Maze and Wheat Improvement Center, also known as CIMIT for short, before moving to Corteva AgriScience, where you were for a number of years before your retirement. Can you talk a bit about your background and, and trace your career trajectory for us? Give us kind of the 411 on that. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the invitation. I'm a trained uh, breeder and uh, spent my last 42 years uh, uh, in connection with plant breeding. Uh, and relevant to this uh, webinar, I have uh, alternated my career between public and private breeding sectors. And that has given me the opportunity uh, to work with different crops such as barley, sorghum, and corn. Uh, at CIMIT, during my last, uh, my last term there, 
I had the opportunity to uh, work as a breeder and later as coordinator in research in Southeast Asia. So this allowed me to have direct contact with the national programs uh, working in corn breeding and helping them uh, with funding, sourcing, and, and developing research plans. So that gave me uh, an understanding of how, how the public breeding uh, works in different countries. Uh, and also later at Corteva, I had the uh, responsibility to del deliver corn products for Mexico, Central America, and, and the Andean countries, and also to lead the global uh, sorghum research efforts in the US, uh, Mexico, and Latin America, and also Australia, including uh, the budgeting and the, uh, the science plans and, and so on. So uh, I, would, I would say that's, that's what I, I can mention about this. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. That's quite the extensive resume you have. And that's why I asked you to be on today because you've had so much experience in these areas. So looking forward to hearing from you. Mikey, time flies. I first met you, I guess it was in 2019 at a meeting of the National Association of Plant Breeders. At the time, I believe you were the chair, I think, of the Plant Breeding Coordinator coordinating committee, which actually founded the National Association of Plant Breeders, and which facilitates, I guess, ongoing discussion on the needs of the especially public plant breeding community in the United States and, and beyond. Mikey, can you give us the 411 on your career in the public sector and, and plant breeding up until now? Sure. So um, I, I I don't have as much experience as, as Fernando, but I've been I, I've been working in in plant breeding for um, about twenty years now. Uh, my my initial work was focused on uh, cover crop breeding uh, actually, and then um, I uh, started working on uh, sunflowers, um, and I, I did a lot of work with. Uh, uh, perennial sunflowers and then uh, wide hybridization and crossing um, and then um, uh, and then I came to the University of Hawaii where I've uh, uh, done a lot of work uh, here um, mostly in pre-breeding and working in uh, a range of species continuing work with wide hybridization and trying to figure out uh, how can we um, do some climate resilience breeding um, in a wide range of crops. And uh, thanks for mentioning the PBCC. So the PB, the Plant Breeding Coordinating Committee is, um, it's, a, it's an organization that is uh, made up of public sector breeders. Uh, currently there's about, uh, there's about, there's reps from about 36 states. I think at the maximum there were about 46 states represented. And yeah, that's exactly what we discuss, the, the status of public sector plant breeding, particularly uh, focused in the U.S. and how the 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 big land grant universities that historically have done all of this breeding, how can they continue to maintain uh, this public good that that plant breeding is? So it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, thank you for your time, Michael. Now we've covered Mexico, United States. Now we're going to move north to Canada. Lauren, you're no stranger to our Canadian audience. Now, Lauren, you're not a plant breeder. You work on the regulatory side, and you've become somewhat of an authority on the intricacies of public and private frameworks and the nuances of each. You spent years with a producer group that funded uh, public breeding work. You now work with Seeds Canada, whose members include many private companies with breeding operations around the country and globally as well. Lauren, can you give our audience a little recap of your experience when it comes to working with, with both public and private breeding systems? Sure, Mark. Um, so as you mentioned, I am not a uh, plant breeder. I started my career in research management back in 2013 with a producer commission here in Alberta. Um, the timing of that is sort of significant in Canada, especially in Western Canada, uh, for a couple of reasons. So the first is that um, the single desk for marketing wheat and barley was dissolved. So for those who are familiar, that's the, the Can Canadian Wheat Board. And they really ran the show when it came to, to wheat policy in Western Canada and barley policy as well. 
Um, so also at around the same time, the Canadian federal government, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, who um, do the majority of public breeding work, um, announced that they were going to get out of finishing varieties. So this caused quite an uproar and it was walked back eventually, but it started the ball rolling on a lot of conversations about farmer owned breeding companies and how do we build capacity in the private sector and it made a lot of consultants probably a lot a lot of money and um today we're very much in the same the same place as we were in in 2013 lots of discussions um but not a lot uh, not a lot has happened um, with the commissions i participated in in negotiations of large funding agreements for public uh, wheat and barley uh, breeding programs. So that's with uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, as well as with the, the universities. And I also participated in the uh, development submission of three national policy framework science clusters um, that uh, were intended to in part support plant breeding activities. Um, also no stranger to some of the side conversations that are going on, including uh, value creation. Um, for those of us in, in Canada, uh, sometimes the, the mention of value creation kind of um, leaves a bit of a sting. Um, and now I'm working uh, in Seeds Canada, with Seeds Canada, uh, trying to ensure the sustainability of our breeding pipelines. I also serve on the Canadian Plant Breeders' Rights Advisory Committee, and uh, I'm a bit of a student of the um, international uh, public plant breeding systems and public um, public private partnerships, and also uh, how these programs are, are funded. Thanks, Lauren. Now, I, I kind of, before we start our, our discussion about public and private breeding specifically, I, I'm hoping that uh, you can each sort of help me paint this picture for our audience on what the landscape looks like in terms of public and private breeding in North America. Now, I want to start with you, Fernando, especially for our Canadian viewers who might not be familiar with, with the Mexican plant breeding sphere. What does that landscape look like at the moment, Fernando, in Mexico with the number, with regard to, say, the number of public sector versus private sector breeding programs? Can you kind of give us a quick synopsis of kind of the, the split there and, and what it sort of looks like? Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I wish I could paint a, a nicer landscape. <laughs> However, uh, what I'm seeing uh, here in Mexico is a, uh, an increased uh, private sector directly involved in, in breeding programs. Uh, most of them, if not all, uh, competing for the same market segments and with the end result of having a, a large investments uh, for key crops, you know, in, in profitable areas. And I would say uh, if, if, if I estimate uh, the type of investment being made by private sector it's uh, almost equal to the uh, to the total budget of, uh, of of one of the national programs uh, running all crops in in mexico so it's uh, uh that's that's uh, what's happening in terms of private and on the other hand uh, the number of effective breeding programs in in the public sector is is decreasing uh, over the years, uh, there are a couple of public uh, efforts that are being maintained, uh, and and this is uh, uh, thanks to the funding for from farmer organizations and and from small companies uh, that benefit from public breeding. But uh, the the end result is uh, a reduction, effective reduction in in number of programs and funding. So a gradual or a substantial increase in the number of private, uh, decrease in the number of public programs. Mikey, I've been attending the NAPB uh, meetings for quite a few years now. So from my understanding, it, it, it's much the same situation in the United States, correct? Uh, 
It, it very much is. Um, uh, the, there was a great article that uh, uh, Kate Evans and uh, Ksenia Gasek um, published in Crop Science, doing an overall survey, um, where where basically the your public sector plant breed, breeding programs are um, uh, aging, getting fewer resources, and not being replaced when folks retire. Um, that, that trend is, uh, uh, you know, much like, like Fernando said, what we're, what we're seeing is we're moving more to things that are, um, stronger commodities. So programs that, um, are able to generate significant royalties or where there are, um, checkoffs from local growers are the ones that are continuing to re release varieties. There's been a big move. Uh, in the public sector to hire breeders who do genetics work and do pre-breeding and release breeding materials, which is incredibly useful. But but historically, right, public sector breeding programs have done a lot more than that. And um, a lot has to do with this reduction in um, uh, re reduction in support for these programs that 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 require kind of concerted long term efforts. Um, because you know you're not it's um w while we have all these known processes uh you know you have to wait for the life cycle of the plant you can't simply make an advance and 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 a month later have it you have to wait for those multiple generations now lauren like you i'm based in canada and so that's where a lot of my experience lies and, and i know in, in canada lauren we've got you know a lot of there's a lot of public or sorry, private breeding in uh, canola, soybeans, corn, uh, cereals tends to still be uh, very heavily dominated by public breeding, etc. But Lauren, you're the expert here. Can you can you give us uh, again that sort of synopsis on what what this landscape looks like for us here in Canada? Well, like you alluded to, Mark, it really does depend on what part of Canada we're in. There are some significant differences in production systems and how things are done in the East and the West. And it also depends on which crop um, we're talking about. So as you mentioned, you know, canola, corn and soy, where there is significant uptake of transgenic events or uh, hybrids, the private sector dominates. There's very little being done in terms of commercialization finishing by the public sector. Pulses and wheat, especially in the Western uh, provinces, it's the public sector that, that dominates um, mainly agriculture and agri-food Canada and, and the universities. Um, there's a, a history in the West of very strong producer support, producer funding towards those pulse and cereal programs and that funding traditionally is, is matched by the government. So this has sort of created a subsidization of these programs and that subsidization um, in concert with the very high use of farm save seed and no universal seed uh, royalty on, on save seed um, as well <laughs> as a very comprehensive registration system for these crops has effectively kept the, the private sector out. In the eastern part of Canada, there is a higher percentage of certified seed use, so we do see more private involvement. And uh, in the last few years, we have started to see some shifts in relationships between producer groups and private breeders. Um, you know, I would point to a fairly recent relationship that was initiated between Lima Grain and the Saskatchewan Pulse um, Commission, but Cereals haven't seen the shift yet. They are still largely funded by producer checkoffs mm -hmm. and rely on government matching funds in these five-year uh, policy programs, which you know are not uh, conducive to the long-term nature of plant breeding. Um, and you know this funding is eroded with every single cycle and budgets get tighter and government priorities start to shift. Now, I want to stick with you here, Lauren, for a moment. And can you kind of give us uh, some idea of how the funding models work for each mm -hmm. of these? Like, obviously, 
private breeding is funded by private for-profit companies. Public breeding is, is you know, ultimately funded by, by the taxpayer dollars. But can you sort of go beyond that for a moment here and, and just explain to the audience sort of the, the major differences between the two funding models? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we have the, the two main sources of public breeding, and that's government programs, mainly federal with AAFC or Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And we also have the universities where obviously teaching and research are very high priorities uh, along with variety commercialization. All these programs rely on grants or funding relationships that are usually partnerships between government and producer funders. Um, there are some, um, there are provincial producer groups that do collect levies and uh, they invest a significant portion of this back into research. Uh, breeding is, is traditionally 60 to 75 percent of that, that research budget. Of course, agronomy makes up the, the rest. There are some annual granting programs that are provincial, and those usually run on three to five year cycles and are matched with funds from provincial governments. And then there are some of the larger federal science clusters that are on five year cycles that uh, are part of the egg policy frameworks. The one that we're currently in is called SCAP or the Sustainable Canadian Agricultural Partnership. And for Western wheat and barley, there is also what we refer to as core agreements. And these are five year agreements that uh, are established by the producer groups in the three Western Prairie provinces and they go to to fund the capacity, including human resources, uh, of the public program. So they're less activity based and more uh, whole um, program based. And uh, in return for for this investment, producers are granted a share of certified seed um, royalties that that would go to these programs, and and those are earmarked for for reinvestment back into them. So um, overall, funding works in the, on the public system in these five-year maximum timeframes. You know, I'll repeat again, not conducive to long-term breeding programs where it can take a decade um, to produce a variety. And it makes a, it creates sort of a patchwork as well, where it can become very, very difficult to um, figure out exactly what the public breeding costs really are, how much the government's contributing, how much is coming from, from other sources. Um, now, of course, in terms of, of private breeding, they, they rely on royalty on seed sold or, or seed used. So when certified seed is sold, there is a royalty that is returned back to the breeding organization. There's also some use agreements that can be put into place to restrict the, the saving or reuse of saved seed. Um, Seeds Canada does administer the value use agreement, which requires a royalty um, that's paid on the declared use of certified of farm save seed of certified seed. So private organizations really only get paid um, when their product is sold. There's, there's not uh, the same grants available to them. And although we are seeing some changes in producer relationships with um, private organizations, we, we don't have those strong uh, partnerships and, and matching funds. Yeah, it's interesting because um, like you say, the public system in, in Canada anyway, relies on these sort of five year cycles, which you say, you know, can maybe not be the best, uh, not very conducive to, to long-term plant breeding, but for a private company, it all comes down to how much you sell, and that can be a double-edged sword too. So uh, there's no, there's no perfect system here, that's for sure. Fernando, in your view, what are the primary objectives that drive public programs, and how do these compare to the objectives of private programs? I mean, having worked in both the nonprofit and and the the for-profit systems, what are the common the common goals, maybe also some of some divergent uh, goals that, that they have in, in the process. Can you kind of shed some light on that for us? Yes. Uh, main objectives of public breeding uh, in, in 
I would say around the world are to provide improved cultivars uh, of the main crops grown in a particular country or system, region. And the mandate of uh, public programs, I have a, a very heavy load of social responsibility and tend to respond to the needs of uh, all the farmer community, regardless of uh, market segments and, and all that. Uh, and also uh, what what I see is that the impact of, uh, especially in the, in the lower income, income countries, the impact from public breeding uh, are felt at, at a larger scale, you know, in terms of food availability, reduction of imports and, and, and food prices uh, and so on. So I, I see having like a more global mandate within, within uh, their scope. Uh, private program objectives are really not different from uh, from public uh, to provide the best cultivar for farmers, but uh, their base is restricted to those who can ensure profitability and, and a return on investment. I mean, that's, that's very clear. If, if I see the commonality, I, I think a common goal for both are uh, trying to respond to the same challenges uh, in for, for each crop in terms of environments, diseases, pests, and, and so on, and, and social requirements uh, to develop the best cultivars for farmers. So different funding models and in terms of the goals of these programs, there are some similarities, but also some very marked uh, differences, obviously, between the public and the private models. Mikey, when... When you think about the funding differences between the two systems and and the uh, the subsequent goals that that result from that, are what are the implications for the types of research that end up being conducted, say in the public sphere? And, and maybe there's some examples from your own program at the University of of Hawaii that that you can give. But I'm thinking there must there must ultimately be implications for for the types of research that end up being conducted. Yes. So, so you, you end up with um, basically these kind of bifurcating uh, approaches um, in, in many ways, where if there is money available, you can be uh, where there's farmer demand, you can be very applied and work uh, for those grower, grower needs. Um, so an example of, uh, of, of that in Hawaii is the papaya seed. Uh, UH released um, uh, a, a real well-known variety, rainbow papaya, about 20 years ago. It's still one of the most popular varieties here. It, it happens to be a hybrid variety. Um, and uh, UH is still a major seed producer that can uh, maintain breeding efforts with by, by seed sales, right? Um, uh, other, but but where, where there's not that revenue generation, um, uh, like in some of the, the vegetable breeding work um, that I'm a part of, what we end up doing is, um, you know, uh, breeding by piecemeal. So we have a pumpkin project uh, working on tropical pumpkins where we had a grant in about uh, 2017. We got through two cycles of selection on that grant. And then we recently uh, we didn't have money to work on that. So those pop that population, those populations remained in the fridge for four years until we recently got a, a little bit more money this year to start working on them again. And 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 it's really kind of, I think, um, this kind of piecemeal approach, depending on what your resources are. Uh, a big benefit, though, that we do have in the public sector is um, we can keep these projects going long term. So, for example, I have a, a graduate student who's working on tree breeding um, and he's working on a project that they're now in their fourth cycle of selection of a project that started in 1981. Right. And keeping a project that doesn't generate revenue going for 42 years. Right. Is is not really something you can do in the private sector. So I, I think it. Um, it actually comes from this kind of clear, you, you have to decide at the institution, which is usually at the state or provincial level, do you want to support um, people's time to work on things that we know could be beneficial in the future, um, but require this upfront uh, work? And I think that that is 
always a balancing act in the in the public policy realm and um and i think that that's where um that's where you can really see foresight or if if places have the ability to invest in these crops but um it's also quite understandable that if uh if a program or if a particular crop is no longer important in that region you see these programs go away and i think that that's one of the implications that we're seeing in, in public plant breeding as we're seeing landscape level change the need to have kind of a whole group of breeders working on huge numbers of different crops might be less necessary as you're seeing kind of a reduction of the total number of crops grown in a region um, and i think you can see this played out again in the number of breeders at different institutions if you kind of look at what are the major agricultural crops there so for uh, an example of that is looking at University of Florida that I think has um, uh, about 40 breeders uh, on staff working on all of these different crops or 40 different breeding programs. Whereas you look at you you look at a place um, uh, you you look at a place uh, say in the in the Midwest where they would have where where they would have fewer. So it's you have the benefit of uh, it, it's the, the big benefit is this ability to do these really long projects on new crops or crops that that require that long period of time. But that rapid responsiveness might not actually be there in the public sector. Yeah, you mentioned the, the policy realm. So obviously, my next question is going to be going to Lauren. Uh, and Mikey, you mentioned, yeah, like keeping a, a program going for 40 years if it's not generating any money in the public or in the private sector, uh, that, that probably doesn't tend to, uh, to go over as well. And so Lauren, in terms of, you know, fostering innovation, bringing new things to market, can you talk a little bit about how public and private breeding programs contribute differently to developing novel crop varieties and technologies like if, if you know mikey's talk, talking about long-term breeding over 40 50 years which maybe you might see happen with a public sector program but with a private sector program it's breeding more with okay you know we need to bring something to market here so that we can recoup our investment and make some money and so i'm thinking there's probably a, a bit of a difference in terms of the innovation that results from these programs yeah i mean absolutely so in general, with um, public programs, the decision makers of those programs generally want to do more upstream research. So sometimes, you know, this is referred to as, as pre-breeding. It's pre-commercialization research that looks at developing traits that are someday going to be incorporated into a commercial variety. So the work tends to be riskier, it's more costly, and usually there's a, a large component, um, a training of, of students is a large component of this work. So, I mean, not just students, but also postdocs and, and other up and coming research talent. You know, private breeding organizations need to sell a variety to make money. So they're going to generally work in the uh, more near commercialization space. So I think though that um, oncoming new uh, technologies are going to complicate this relationship a little bit in the future. Um, when we start to see trait development through techniques like gene editing, they're only available to those with the appropriate licenses or patents on the technology. So I think it's gonna be interesting to see what type of development comes from the private sector in the future. Um, but generally, you would see that that riskier blue sky work come from come from the public sector, and then you know the private sector is packaging it and delivering a product. And it's interesting the the pumpkin patchwork um, program that that Mikey referred to. I think that would really resonate with a lot of uh, public breeders here in Canada. Yeah, and it kind of leads me into my next question, which I'm going to direct your way for Fernando, and in terms of access to new varieties, having worked with an organization like Simit, you talked earlier about global breeding goals, bringing new, new varieties slash products to parts of the world that, that really uh, need them, require them. And I'm thinking here of say like smallholder farmers, for example, can you talk a little bit of Fernando about public versus private programs when it comes to the accessibility 
of new varieties? I mean, having worked in both spheres, how do the public versus private sectors stack up in that regard? Well, I, I, when, when I think about the uh, private sector model uh, for what they produce, the markets they want to work in, and, and also uh, evaluating every time their performance uh, with competitors and so on, uh, I see a big limitation in, in terms of uh, accessibility to new varieties because it's it's going to be restricted no matter what to to those markets where where they are uh, they're working and and usually small farmers even even within the same region small farmers don't have access to that uh, either because of price or uh, just the environmental condu conditions not conducive to to have top performing cultivars in in their area. In, in terms of uh, public, uh, I know the impact, as, and I think this has been mentioned already, the impact for uh, self-pollinated crops is uh, undeniable. I mean, uh, talk about wheat uh, and the wheat impact that CIMIT has had uh, around the, the globe, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and for, for other crops such as uh, corn or hybrid, uh, crops is, is more difficult to to demonstrate that uh, that impact uh, you know globally and 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 I think uh, I, I think about CIMIT having global mandates for wheat and corn and uh, as, as you know I mean all plant breeders uh, know that uh, our target environments uh, are some are restricted by you know how wide or how common that environment is uh, in other areas. So uh, the limitation I see with with uh, public sector. I mean, you have uh, improved cultivars, and and really, like if you think about Mexico, it it is uh, farmer organizations making possible the production of those varieties and making them accessible to to most farmers. Uh, and if if there is no uh, government funding it's it, we're finding also restrictions to to make uh, improved cultivars available to everyone now before we sign off for the day i kind of want to bring things full circle here because the the concept of this webinar is uh, finding ground between public and private sector breeding programs. And, and Mikey, having been involved with an organization like Plant Breeding Coordinating Committee, National Association of Plant Breeders, the NAPB includes people who work in both the public and private spheres. And, and I'm curious here, I, I'd like to paint a picture for people on how public and private systems interact with each other. Mikey, are there any instances of you know, information exchange, technology, sh technology sharing, joint research efforts between private and public sector that, that you found noteworthy? Yeah, I mean, uh, they, they, they happen all the time. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of it is, uh, as you said, Mark, on the technology development side. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is really, really important is you have this space in the public sector, um, uh, like Lauren was saying, to do risky stuff. But whether that risky stuff that works in your in kind of your model um, breeding program, whether that's going to scale up to where you can impact a, a, a much larger number of people is unknown in a lot of cases. And that's where I see a lot of these partnerships working really well. So, you know, uh, back in the day, it was well, can we really operationalize marker assisted or genomic selection? Um, you know, and there were wonderful collaborations um, between a number of different companies and uh, and and the and the universities. Um, uh, and then and then now I'm seeing similar things with phenomic selection. Um, you know, and again, uh, these these partnerships are with the the seed companies, the technology companies. 
universities and and with the the CG centers, right, the um, places like Simit, and and I think, I think those work really well, and and um, I think I think Fernando is a great example. People are constantly moving back and forth, you know, and and but I think there there are these different. Um, the, the 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 kind of the different goals and i think that that one thing that that uh there there can be this kind of real synergy is this idea of really trying to figure out well when is this new technology something that's really good at this small scale and can help maybe a region and when is this technology something that can be scaled up to the national or international level and i and i think that that's where we really can see a lot of um these really fruitful collaborations. But again, as, as Lauren mentioned as well, it depends on who gets access to that technology. And that's that's one of the areas where I think um, the plant breeding sector in general, we don't necessarily think about that as much. We just think about trying to develop cool technology. Yeah, well, and, and in terms of innovation, Lauren, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that, okay, so you've got, you know, maybe a public sector program that's been, had this 40 year research program sort of playing that long game. And then you've got a, a private sector company that's maybe not, you know, maybe not looking that far ahead in the future. They've got, you know, maybe shorter term goals, maybe, but then if there's a opportunity for collaboration, you've done this 40 years of research and you found something really interesting that you can maybe now have a partnership with private sector that has all this financial firepower behind it that can scale that up and bring it to a more international audience, for for example. And, and Lauren, in, in your experience, how do the differences between public and private breeding programs influence the speed at which new varieties are developed and brought to market? Are there any noted differences? Because I mean, breeding is a long-term game. It doesn't matter what you're developing, you're looking at 10 years, 12 years. And, and so whether it's public sector or private sector, I imagine they run into some of those same timelines, but are, are there any major differences, Lauren? Yeah, I think there are major differences. I think all breeders as researchers, so not talking about the program, not talking about the decision maker in the program, but the actual physical person uh, has a desire to get technology into the hands of the user, the farmer, as quickly as possible. So I don't want I don't want any of my comments um, to be taken as, you know, public researchers don't care when their product gets out. That's not really true. But you know, I think private industry, as we mentioned earlier, they need to be able to to make a sale, to make a profit. And without a finished product, you don't have a product to sell. So private industry does need to move fast. And I think they've they've developed a lot of, of, of different innovations uh, that they've incorporated to be able to do this. Public groups uh, tend to be at the mercy of government bureaucracy, which, you know, can slow down science. Um, there's gaps in research funding that can cause gaps in the breeding pipelines, like the example of something being stuck in the fridge for, for 40 years. Uh, you have changes in government policy priorities, um, which can cause work to be abandoned or, or focus a shift. Um, you know, sometimes uh, forces are working against public breeders and their effort to, to help um, put these new innovations on the market. I think, you know, um, our registration system in Canada does cause some bottleneck when it comes to the speed of getting a product out. If, um, if you're working in a crop that, that is um, subject to merit requirements for registration, there's, um, there's a limit to the speed. So, um, you know, I think, I think there's quite a few things that are, that are limiting. And uh, I also don't want it to be assumed that I, that I mean that the private sector is just putting out whatever they can. Uh, there's a lot of risks to the private sector of developing and putting out, um, you know, what we would call a, a dog variety. So, um, you know, certainly they're they're not just rushing through and putting anything out on the market. Um, but there's there's definitely differences in in what can be available, what can be uh, mobilized to to the two different systems. And quick question from our audience for, for, for you, Lauren. And again, for our audience, if you have a question, just type it into the, uh, the YouTube chat box. Uh, Lauren, do you know the percent of funding that will be provided by royalty payments on certified seed sales on public varieties? 
So that's a really tricky one. And I think I mentioned before how it can be difficult to determine the sort of the patchwork of funding and, and what goes where and what comes from where. So each institution will have a different policy um, with regards to what goes back to the program. Um, you know, for instance, um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, it's largely assumed that a lot of their, their royalties don't go back to the program, but to uh, general revenue. Producer groups, if they have a core breeding agreement with that organization, will get a share of revenue or a share of those royalties to reinvest. Um, and that's not always automatic. It can sort of build up and then it's reinvested in a large chunk. And then, you know, some of the universities will have some sort of a intellectual property office working with them. And there will be different rules, again, around what goes to the program, what goes to university, what goes to the department, uh, to the faculty. So it, it's not really a, a nice, you know, 10% answer. Um, but I would say that it would be, um, you know, it's less than 10% of the total program costs, especially for those crops where um, farm safe seed use is so high. When there is large use of certified seed, obviously the royalties going back are higher and, and can actually sustain the program. Um, but with such high uh, farm safe seed use, you know, 80% or more in certain crops, that really restricts the amount of um, royalty revenue that can that can sustain a program. Now, before we sign off for the day, I want I to. Uh, Mikey sort of had a comment. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, Mikey. Sorry. My apologies. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say. So, um, there the 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 PBCC actually worked on this for uh, land grant institutions. And uh, uh, Julie Dawson and Bill Tracy wrote a paper about this, about best practices for universities. And the, the, what, what the typical program you see for the universities is that up to the first 70, 50 or $70,000, all of that money would go back to the program. And after that, it's exactly as Lauren would describe where it's a split between the institution, the department and the inventors. Usually it's a 50% goes to the institution, um, something like 20% is split between the inventors and 30% would go to different units within the, uh, the college and things like that. Um, but it is, again, exactly as Lauren said, for, for things where people save seed, it's basically a one-time sale. Uh, um, so that's why in some cases why people, they've moved to licensing agreements rather than um, standard IP practices. But, th but if you are more interested in that, there's, um, there's a number of, of uh, publications on, on how the U.S. has tried to have, have some sort of common policy around that. Fernando, I saw you nodding your head there for a moment, and, and that kind of leads me into to my... Uh one of my last questions here, and that's sort of the, the path forward, you know, given the situation in Mexico and, and the United States, and, you know, where public breeding has historically been very important. But like you say, in recent years, we've seen a, a decline in that. And especially when it comes to people who sell seed retailers, Fernando, what's your advice for, for how we can move forward as we see this gradual uh, decline in public breeding and private breeding becoming more dominant what what does the future hold and and how can our industry uh, pre prepare for that i think a, a, an advice that i would give to public breeding programs uh, is to identify areas for collaboration and consolidation uh, i i see a tendency particularly in mexico to have very very small programs that really don't have a, a, a big impact in, in in what they do and and I think that consolidation uh, to make grow the effective size of a breeding program, uh, utilizing breeding resources like genetic markers, testing locations, and leveraging as much as possible and collaborating, uh, exchanging germplasm. I think that's, uh, that's one thing I would do because I see a lot of dilution effect. Uh, the second advice would be strengthening their position in developing uh, germplasm and products specific 
specifics for areas where the public, uh, the private sector will not will not go. I mean, uh, th think about Mexico with a, uh, a corn area of eight million hectares uh, almost, and only about thirty percent being uh, served by the private sector. Um, there is a lot of room left for 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 making a big impact. And the third is to increase uh, the lobbying and demonstrating value. I mean, I, uh, again, using the Mexico example, uh, the average is uh, a little bit over three tons per hectare in Mexico. Just when, when, when in the in the main markets, uh, the average is already ten tons per hectare. So, you, in, increasing yields by by uh, one ton per hectare. The impact that has on Mexico is uh, reducing imports of about eight million uh, tons, and uh, put up a value, any value to that, and it's, it's a huge amount of money. And and a small fraction of that reinvested in research would would make a, a, a long way. But uh, I think that's where where we we need to continue. Uh, and then uh, in, in the future, what I see is, I mean, private sector model will not change and it will be concentrated on markets that drive a, a high return on, on investment. Uh, and I think there is a large opportunity to scale up uh, the number of uh, smaller companies uh, that work at the regional level and working in a coordinated way and contributed contributing to sustain uh, public reading. Uh, I, I see that as a, as a big opportunity and linking that with farmer organizations. I, I think that's that's how we should look at the, uh, the future uh, of public breeding and accessibility of new varieties for, for, for more people. Now, Mikey, you published a paper in 2019 and it, it included uh, a line here I found interesting. You said the, the decline in public plant breeding has come at a time when we might need it more than ever. Why, in your opinion, do we need public breeding more than ever? And, and how, like I asked Fernando earlier, how, how do we move forward there? Well, I think, I think we need it more than ever because we're really trying to um, get more different things from our agricultural systems. We're trying to get improved yield. We're trying to get improved um, ecosystem services like soil health, water quality. Um, we're trying to have more diverse crops on the landscape. And um, if we want to have, um, if we want to have these diversified systems, uh, a lot of the crops are kind of semi-domesticated. Uh, and there's a lot of gains that can be made quickly with plant breeding in conjunction with the management work. And if we don't put in that effort, we may not we may not be able to get the the, the benefits of these agro ecosystems that we really want. Um, uh, and, and I think also in particular, everyone knows breeding is a long term process. We look at all the projections for where our climate will be in 2050. Um, in 2070, in, in 2100, right? And the decisions we make now affect the varieties that are available in 2050, right? You know, uh, if we're on a 12 year cycle, right? We have two cycles before, tw you know, two, two new cycles of, for varieties to be released before we hit those points. And so I think we really need to realize that, you know, this is not, it's not a short term. It, Plant breeding isn't, um, you know, isn't uh, computer engineering. You're not going to make that one discovery that moves you uh, forward. You know, it isn't this isn't this, you know, massive jump forward. It takes the time and time is not time. Time is the life cycle of whatever it is, the species that you're working on. And so I think that's why we really need to renew our efforts in plant breeding and, and make sure that Make sure that we're giving people the time and the resources to do what, you know, people have done for millennia, you know, and we want to be able to keep doing that. Lauren, I'll uh, give you the, the last word here before we sign off again to our audience. If you have a question, just type it into the YouTube chat box. Uh, Lauren, yeah, how, in your opinion, how do we find more, you know, common ground between these 
public and, and private systems? Yeah, I'm not exaggerating when I say that I think about this every day, multiple times a day. Um, you know, I see many long days ahead for me. We're, we're at a really critical juncture, I think, in Canada. Um, we have, we, especially with crops that have significant farm safe seed use that rely on publicly funded plant breeding. Um, our traditional funding mechanisms are eroding. Um, and even if they weren't, our, our entire system, plant breeders' rights, registration, funding, et cetera, uh, really does ensure that the competition and innovation is kept at a minimum. And, you know, that innovation just sort of trickles, trickles in. We really do need to do better. Um, we run the risk of, of everything sort of turning to a stop. And then it takes a really long time to, to get things started again. Um, we, we need our, our agriculture industry needs consistently filled pipelines, flowing pipelines of, of new um, genetic innovation. We need to make sure that we're working in the background to develop alternative capacity and equitable pathways um, for remuneration for, for private programs and in addition to public programs. Um, you know, we, we need to have our producers, our public sector and our private sector really working together. And these are these are not going to be easy conversations. These are going to be some of those, you know, pull up your socks type um, type meetings. But we need to start um, pushing for change and, and making sure that producers and, and policymakers understand the, the implications of, of doing nothing and going along uh, our current path. So I think there's room and, and need for both systems. And you know, I think my fellow panelists have, have painted the picture about the, the benefit and the need for, for public breeding in addition to, to private breeding, especially um, you know, in, with all the challenges that, that we're facing. Um, right now though, in Canada, we don't have a proper balance. And eventually, you know, this the scales are gonna tip. And it's um, it's going to be um, it's going to be disastrous, I fear. So, you know, I don't want to I don't want to be fear mongering. But, you know, I really I really do um, hope that, um, you know, everyone gets the motivation to to decide to work together to build a, a sustainable framework for the future of variety development here in Canada. Yeah, I think that's that's a really important uh thing to say Lauren and, and, and a good way to to end our webinar today is is this idea of you know we need to work together and, and there tends to be this a lot of the time this idea and I see Mikey you're really nodding your head that uh, there's this idea that you know public and private sectors it's a competition public versus private and I think I may have even worded it that way a couple of times during the webinar but but really you know there's there's it's not the competition that they're at odds with each other, but like you say, Lauren, there's there's so many opportunities to collaborate and work together here, and, and that's uh, something that that any industry could could probably stand to do more of. I think, and I think you definitely agree, Mikey. Completely, C completely, and I think I think our public and private sectors, you know, they 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 fill different niches, and they need to work together because they're providing different expertise in different areas, and and there's and they're good at different things, and the more they can work together to 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 complement one another instead of like you say compete, I think I think the better off we all are. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, Fernando, I'll g give you the last word. Did you have anything you wanted to add on that? No, I think uh, I'm, I'm speaking for for the Mexico uh, uh, last landscape, as you mentioned. But you know, universities and public breeding programs, uh, at least in Mexico, we have a big, big task ahead to uh, work on legal framework uh, royalties. Uh, schemes for intellectual property and uh, I guess we are far behind uh, other countries where I know that's working you know here it's very difficult to define the value of, of an inbred made avail available from the public sector to the private uh, private company so in, in all of that I think uh, you know having that framework would help a lot to bring together private and public uh, efforts. 
Yeah, as they say, it's a long road ahead, but I hope today's discussion has has helped people to better understand this topic and that uh, whatever they take away from this can maybe help facilitate some of those, those conversations in the future. So thank you everybody for your time today. This was a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Fernando, Mikey, and Lauren for joining me today. Thanks so much. And I just wanted to thank our webinar sponsors one more time, 2020 Seed Labs and CCAN for their support. Again, a recording of this webinar will be available in the coming hours on seedworld.com and germination.ca. And I just want to thank our audience one more time uh, for spending your, your lunch hour with us. Or if you're in Hawaii, uh, it's uh, considerably earlier for you. So thank you, Mikey, for joining us because it's like 7 in the morning for you right now. So for those of you tuning in from Hawaii, I appreciate you getting up early. So thanks so much for your time, everybody. Have a great day. This is Mark Sinkowitz signing off. <laughs>